you know, which one of these these adjuster schools should I go to? Go to all of them. I mean, yeah. come on, this is your income and your ability to do this job and to crush it as an adjuster depends on you being really good at the job, not what you can put on a resume saying, checking off some checkbox, right? Level two Xactimate certification. You don't, long story short, you don't get the level two Xactimate certification so you can put it on your resume to impress somebody who's not even gonna look at it. They're just gonna put you on the roster. Right. You get that so that you can be good at Xactimate and you can be a good adjuster. Exactly. That's why you do. That's that. why you do it. You don't. It's not. Do not. You do all these things for yourself first, so that you can be good at the job. If you're good at the job, then you're going to be. You're going to work. They're going to put you to work, because they need good people. Right. right. Hello, Matt. What's happening, James? What you got for me? Well, I have a disclaimer for you. Disclaimer. So in this. In this episode, we may be venturing into the land of finance, finance and tax. We are not professionals. We are absolutely not professionals. Do not, under any circumstances, take any of this as tax advice, legal advice, f personal finance advice, anything. Investment advice. Investment advice. Trust me, if you saw my credit score, you would not be taking advice from me. <clears throat> so, I, you know, I mean... We have a general idea of what we're going to talk about, yep. but we may, who knows where we're going to end up. I mean, so we're just spitballing. This is for entertainment yep. purposes only, et cetera. So. All right. Bad Mixtapes commented from YouTube and said, once you have your home state license, what is the next step to become a cat adjuster and where do you go for training? Quick follow up to that. These are three that were kind of similar questions. I think we could knock out in one. Um, Benjamin Turnberg says, how about a segment on part-time work opportunities or how to slowly and gradually transition into the insurance adjusting field? Got that one. Roxy Foxy commented from YouTube, said how to go about your career as soon as you get your license. Autodesk adjusting virtual assist. I know for sure I have to work on getting more license and extra certifications. I guess it all depends on your particular situation, savings and et cetera. So, once you have your home state license, what do you do? To become a cat adjuster. To become so a cat adjuster. First, you're going to find some cats. Yep, yep. You get a little table. Yep. That has some straps on it. Yep. And then you put the cat on the table. And then you can get like some hair dye or, you know, um, that would have kind of a. Never mind. Hair, higher hair dye? Well, let's get some hair dye. It's kind of adjust the way they look, you know. Yeah, or, you know, you can like. Give them a little massage yeah. on the back. That would give like, a little like, a like a little chiropractor adjustment. Like a cat there. chiropractor. Yeah, you, you can, can do adjust that. them that way. So, or what you could do is, because um, you don't have experience, but it's the first thing you always do. It's the same thing for everybody. Number one is, you have a home state license. That's not enough to become a cat adjuster. So no. you need to start looking at other states <laughs> and uh, and getting more licenses while at the same time contacting IA firms and start getting on rosters, yeah. okay? Um, I would strongly suggest find, find cup, get on at least five rosters, okay? And, you know, I would always suggest probably some of the bigger ones you've heard, suggest those first, you know, get a good mix of some of the bigger ones and smaller ones, and um, but get more licenses, you know? Um, I did mine a little different. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I'm a rebel. Uh, everybody says, get your Gulf Coast licenses first. You know, Who says that? A lot of people say that. I don't say that. I hear a lot of people say, get your Gulf Coast license first. But then I heard other people say, you know, look at where the hell's at. Get your hell states. Get your hell states first. That's what I say. So I live in Texas. So I just started doing the little halo effect around Texas. And... For me, I did like next was Oklahoma and then Arkansas, Louisiana, and then I went to Mississippi and, you know, just kind of branched out from there and then Kentucky and, you know, just covered all the hell states and I uh, got quite a few licenses and then all of a sudden I realized I didn't have Florida and Georgia recently and so that kind of kicked me out of some work. So I've gotten them since then. But um, I started with the hell licenses first, the hell states first, and then I um, 
then I got made sure I filled them in with the, the hurricane states, Gulf Coast states. So that's what you really need to do because without those licenses, they really can't do anything with you. Um, you just say, well, I'm going to my home state and I just won't take anything unless it's in a state that doesn't require a license. Well, <laughs> what if those states don't get you any opportunities? So look what Matt has here. Are you interested in more than just punching a clock and paying the bills? Wouldn't you rather be on the A-team surrounded by the best of the best in the industry? Then you need to check out Eberl Claim Service. For well over 30 years, Eberl's philosophy of treating adjusters as they wish to be treated has allowed them to establish a vast network of the most professional, educated, and dedicated adjusters in the industry. So at Eberl, you're in good company. If you're a motivated and compassionate adjuster slash claims professional, Eberl wants you to represent their organization. Go to jobs.eberls.com right now and get started with Eberl Claim Service. So if you're listening to this, you can't see it, but it's uh, the reciprocity map at adjusterpro.com. Um, and it shows in gray, for those of you who are watching, <clears throat> the states that do not require adjuster licenses. And there are quite a few, and they're all kind of concentrated in the middle of the country. So if you look at Texas down there, you know, you've got uh, Oklahoma, Arkansas, New Mexico, New Mexico, Louisiana, kind of the, are around the state, right? <laughs> If I'm telling you which licenses to get after you get your home designated home state license or your home state license, let me back up one step. So your home state license, if you live in a state that is not gray, you have to get your home state license first in the state that you live in. So if you live in Wyoming, you cannot get your designated home state Texas license. You have to get your Wyoming state license first as your home state license. Okay? non-negotiable you cannot ch deviate from that if you live in nebraska then you can get any other state that you want within reason i think for the most part and designate that as your home state license right traditionally people do texas or florida or indiana i was recently told that florida is probably the best dhs license to get because they require fingerprints they have their reciprocal i mean they're almost all the states that are reciprocal are reciprocal with every, almost every other state yep. right texas so requires fingerprints yeah so florida adjuster pro they told me that florida was a good one to get first at least this was back in spring early summer of 2020 that because they have a really fast turnaround and it's it's also a great license to right. get in general um but anyway, so you have to get your designated home state license. At the, at the time of this, we're saying Florida, but you could get your Indiana. You know, I think they, I can't remember if they require fingerprints or not, but get one that requires fingerprints because then those fingerprints count for everybody else. And your test counts for everybody for reciprocal purposes. And the way reciprocity works, again, is that if you have your Texas license and it's reciprocal with most other states, that doesn't mean that you can just go work in Wyoming because they have a they reciprocate it means that when you you have to get your wyoming license if you want to work in wyoming but wyoming will recognize all of the things that you did to get your texas license adjust your license to get your wyoming license so your your pre-licensing your exam and all that stuff fingerprints and the nine yards right so when you go to get your wyoming license you just have to pay the fee and fill out the application and they'll give you a Wyoming license because you already passed the test in Texas. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Right. So that's kind of the, basically the way reciprocity works. I tell people that I'm going to get after my DHS or my home state, depending on where you live, I'm going to get Texas, Oklahoma, Minnesota, Indiana, and Florida. Those are the ones I'm going to grab. Um, because for the first, basically the first five licenses I'm going to get, because Florida sticks out there in the Gulf and it's, it's probably more likely to get hit, hit than other Gulf states for hurricanes. Um, they also have, there's a lot of cat opportunities in Florida, Texas, because Texas gets more hail than the next five hail states combined. Right. And they pay more money gets spent down there on, on hail damage than right. And then Minnesota, because they're the only state in the upper Midwest that 
or one of the only states besides maybe Michigan that has requires a license. And if you work in Minneapolis or you work in Minnesota, the pricing there for the when you when you buy a twenty five square roof in Minnesota, it's like twice or two and a half times the price of the same exact roof in Kansas City. For some reason, I'm not sure why. Also, the matching rules. It's a good place to go run claims because you can make you a lot more. You let that secret out of the back. It's a secret, but I you know. know. I'm just kidding. That's why when you go, the drawback is when you go work Minnesota, for any kind of, like they get like a funny shaped cloud passes over the city and every contractor within six states is in Minneapolis knocking on doors. It's chaos, it's a nightmare. But when you get legit hail there, the claims are great. I saw a contractor from Texas that I know in Minnesota oh, yeah. when I was up there. Yeah. I, see, I mean, it, you start to see faces, yep. right? So, and then I would get New York after that because New York is, it is legit the golden ticket, the golden, the golden license. And then I would fill in the rest of the Gulf states, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, for sure. I would fill in the Northeast states keeping in mind that you want to keep all your options open as a cat, as a cat adjuster. And as if you're going to do any desk work or remote work, you, it's more important even to be licensed in more states, because if you live in Texas and if you want to desk adjust claims from New Hampshire, you have to have a New Hampshire license, right? And they get, it's densely populated up there, Connecticut. I mean, all, Everywhere up there, that, that eastern seaboard area is just jam-packed with people in their houses, and they're all insured, right, most of them. And then I'm going to pick up the northwest, because Portland and Seattle are big, huge metro areas, and this whole this whole corridor down Interstate 5 down the coast on the west side is densely populated, and they have a lot of need up there. I know that some insurance companies have trouble keeping these areas staffed for some reason, for whatever reason. Um, there's work up there. I've worked daily. I didn't live there. So I was like, hey, well, you got some any daily work? We're traveling in the RV. And I went and worked daily claims up in around Seattle and Portland. That's awesome. For, you know, several months. Right. And then from there, fill in the rest. But I'm going to start with those first five, which is going to be Texas, Oklahoma, Minnesota, Indiana, and Florida. We throw New York on there and then start filling in Southeast, Northeast, Northwest. California, I've worked California several times and I've never had a California license. This is another thing I wanted to touch on with licensing as a CAT adjuster. Sometimes you can work as a uh, emergency, you can work under a, an emergency license. Some states have them automatically. Other states like New York may, the governor may come out and say, because Hurricane Sandy, for example, they may pop out and say, you know, governor's directive, we're authorizing temporary licenses for 90 days or 45 days or whatever it is um, to cost this much to you let you do this, that, and the other thing, right? And then you can work under that temporary license. And I've, again, I've worked a couple of wildfires in California as well as several mud slide things in Southern California. I didn't have a license there. I don't even know if I had a temporary license or if, if I needed one. Um, I think the the I firm or insurance company you work for actually carries holds your license out there. Right, right. So, so they have some sort of a blanket license or whatever, right? So, the practical application of what I'm saying here is basically that if you if you if you're just getting started and you got your Texas and you're and you're working on you know it costs a lot of money to get all these licenses. If you can't afford to get all of them, get all of them, but a big hurricane hits Florida and you don't have your Florida license. Don't not work in Florida because you you don't have the license. Tell the you know the firm you can get an emergency license. They can put you under a blanket emergency license. You can apply for it and get started on the process and go. Right. Don't not go. Don't don't sit there and not call firms and tell them that you're available to work if you don't have a license somewhere when you see some big thing on the news because you, you may be able to go right anyway because they can work around or work with you or there's there's other avenues to get licensed to work in certain states. You ideally, you want to get all of them. Right. Like in the, in the perfect world, you want to be licensed everywhere you can because then that, that opens up and maximizes your opportunities for work. We, I say get your Midwest, Hale Quarter states licenses first because the, your chances are you're going to, 
in your career as a, as a cat property adjuster, probably as a cat auto adjuster, you're going to be in the Midwest yep. doing hail, right? It's it's the thing that always happens every year. Like yeah. I never had a year where I did, we didn't have a hailstorm somewhere, right. someplace. But you don't always get a hurricane. Don't always get a hurricane. Yeah. This 20, year, 2019, nothing hit the U.S. Nothing hit the U.S. Right, and it's it's. You can go several years, more than one or two or three right. years between like major landfalling events where people there's enough work where everybody's going, or it's, or if it's or it's your big chance as a newbie because those big events are a lot of times the one of the few opportunities, big opportunities that people have. It's a roll of the dice. You don't know. The experts come out and they say. You know, well, this year we're you know we're forecasting because El Nino and you know this, all the slide rule stuff that we're there's going to be 19 storms, 19 named storms, and you know 11 of them are going to make landfall, and four of them are going to be category four or higher, or whatever, right? Always, always later in the year as, as the peak starts to come on in August, September, October. Uh, experts surprised at a uh, lack of hurricane activity in spite of early forecast. Da, 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 da. They're almost always wrong. Almost right. always, right? It's the, this is the weather we're talking about, okay? We can barely predict it out three days, let alone a year or six months, let alone 100 years. Well, that's a whole other story. If you're an auto claims adjuster or appraiser, you already know that SCA is one of the top companies that you can work for on the auto side. But if you're a property adjuster who's never done any auto, you may have never even heard of SCA. We've heard of them now. SCA Claim Services is launching their property division and they're poised to bring their decades of claims management experience and extensive resources to the property side of things. Insurance carriers already trust SCA because they know they will always receive a high level of customer service and policyholder satisfaction. And with literally millions of claims handled in SCA's four decade history, carriers trust SCA to help them avoid unnecessary costs by handling every claim, every time with unparalleled accuracy and a commitment to doing things the right way. I mean, these guys are old school, right? Since 1979, SCA has been exceeding expectations. Only a company dedicated to serving and taking care of people, including their adjusters, can a company like this continue to grow in this industry. Join the team with industry-leading NPS scores and cycle times that has the resources to bring new opportunities for not only auto adjusters, but now for property adjusters. To get started with SCA Claim Services, head on over to adjustertv.com slash SCA and while you're there, don't forget to download the totally free SCA Claim Services Field Adjuster Gear Guide. Again, that's adjustertv.com slash SCA to download the free gear guide and to apply. When you're looking, when, you, when you're getting into this work and you're sitting there thinking, well, you know, everybody that I know that's got into, gotten into this, you know, my uncle or my, my neighbor's uncle, he got his start on Hurricane Katrina. My, this other person got their start on Hurricane Irma. <clears throat> So-and-so got their start on Hurricane Laura. So-and-so this, you know, Hurricane this, Hurricane that. I got my start on a hailstorm in Chicago. Those hurricanes don't happen every year. You can't say, all right, this is, this is the path into, and we talked about this a little bit earlier. This is, this is the path because these people have the same path, that's the path that I'm gonna take into this world. This is the way. This is the way. There's no way, right? Right. There's a, there's a general direction that you go, but as far as the path, they, they, they wind and twist over each other and there's a whole bunch of them. There's a whole bunch of different ways to skin this cat, for sure. So, if we wanna dive into, you know, kind of the, a, a good way to do it where you, you reduce, you minimize the opportunities for dead ends or not finding any path, right? Nothing happened, none of these opportunities pop up. There's no hurricane for three years. Absolutely could happen. Yep. If you're counting on a hurricane to get started, you're not working for three years. You're, you're doing something else. And then you're probably not ever gonna do it, right? right. I wouldn't, I mean, so what, what sort of an expectation should a person have and what's a good way to kind of minimize the dead ends and have a kind of a path to get into this to where you, you maximize your opportunities when, when those opportunities do come that you can take advantage of them, be in a position to take advantage of them. What's a good way to do that? 
So what I did, which to stop you, right. would answer Benjamin Turnberg's question about how to slowly and gradually transition into the insurance adjusting field. And those two go hand in hand with each other, yep. which are exactly pretty much what I did. Um, when I got started and I was trying to figure out how I was going to get in this business, not only did I, not only did I binge watch adjuster TV uh, constantly, um, figuring it out and doing all my research, I ended up um, doing virtual assist, man. You know, I ended up doing, um, you know, I'll, I'll give them a free plug on this one one time. I did pilots, um, inspectors on demand. I I contacted them. They said, hey, you've got experience in, in uh, construction and roofing, and we could use you over here. You know, and so I, I started doing it, and I did well, you know. And the great part about that is it's an app. Um, you do it when you want to do it. Um, they send it to you. It comes with a quote unquote preset time. It's not really a preset time. It's just kind of something that's been thrown in there. You just contact the homeowner and you say, look, this is what I've received in the app. They show, they said that your time is set up for this. Is there another time that's better? This would work better for me. Does that work for you? you just work it out. You go when you want to and get it taken care of. Those people are just very, most people are very flexible with the time. They understand that, understand that you weren't the one they spoke to and you just go get your, and you can start that off part-time, yeah. easily start that part-time and, and work when you want to work. And what that does is it's going to teach you great scoping skills. Okay. You're going to get lots of practice scoping. Um, if you don't do something, they're going to let you know you didn't do it. And it's really not a lot of stress. There's not a lot of, um, it's a low expect. There's there is some demands for quality. Don't get me wrong, but at the same time, it's not a. It's just not a high expectation for perfection. Okay, uh, they want quality. They want everything else, but they know that hey, you're the guy out there doing this, and you know if they need it, you're there on the spot, and you can take care of it while you're still there when you get on the phone with the adjuster. Great way to get started part time. Yeah. Um, another one is is that uh, if you. Um, you of course have a, a background in automotive. You've taken one of the sort you know one of the um, classes out there that you can do um, get certified in auto training, uh, certified auto training, and and do daily appraisals. It's a great way to get started as well. Again, you're getting contacted. You're setting up your time. You're setting up your schedule. It's a great way to get started. Once you get comfortable with it and start getting more business, then you can make the jump into it. Two great ways of getting started in the business. Auto route, um, it's hard to get started in that. It's it's not just oh well, hey I know how to, you know I know how to count dents on hail and I know how to estimate a vehicle. Uh, if you live in densely populated areas, and I'm going to primarily say Dal like Dallas Fort Worth where I live, it, it, it's almost impossible to get started. I mean I didn't get started in my home market. I I actually had to travel to West Texas and worked out there for several months uh, because. There's just not enough work in Dallas Fort Worth with all the adjusters and appraisers right. that are there. Oversaturated. Market. It's oversaturated. But by doing what I did was I you know, it once I got back home and they supported me and I and I get regular work now. So there's a good ways to get started. There's more than one company out there that does the virtual assist thing. Okay. And again, once you receive your notification that there's something available and you accept it, you just contact the homeowner and you set it up for a time that is convenient for both of y'all now if you receive something on a monday and you don't have time to do it until saturday don't accept that job okay don't need they still need you to they still need good cycle times right okay uh, but that's a good still a good way to get started especially during the spring and summer when your days are longer and and you can go after work and do an inspection a uh, great way to do it or you know only make yourself available turn your app on on thursday or friday and that way you can get them knocked down on over the weekend yeah because nobody's working the weekend so that doesn't count against your cycle time right play the cycle time game um so great ways to get started there that's that's like I said that's what i did uh that's where i got going of course i started off on the property side and it was doing it was doing a virtual assist assignment is whenever i had my unexpected dismount off of a roof <laughs> and uh we'll go into that later um but uh, and then that's what pushed me into doing a rapid unplanned dismount. That's correct. <laughs> um, 
Rudd. Rudd. The Rudd. The Rudd. But, uh, and then once that happened, I was like, well, what am I going to do now? You know, I can't climb roost, but I'm not going to give up on becoming an IA. And so I turned around and focused on auto. And by the 1st of September, so I, I came off the roof in June. And by the 1st of September, I'd had knee surgery, recovered. And um, I was in West Texas living out of my RV. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and totally you know, immersed myself in it at that point. So that's how that went down, but that's a great way to get started. Even doing auto, again, you're, you're doing it on your time, but you need to make sure that you can get out to the shops and things like that and people's homes, especially if the vehicle's at a shop during their business hours. Uh, and amazing that a lot of body shops don't work weekends. They're closed really? on Saturdays. A lot of body shops, if they're open on a Saturday, it's only to deliver a car for a couple hours and then they're closed. Huh. After that, a lot of body shops do that. So that's my suggestion as far as getting part time work starting off. Outside of that, I'm not aware of anything. There may be other opportunities. I'm just not aware of them. Yeah. I, I think um, because of the new technology and the way things are kind of going, that it does open up opportunities for people to get started in this. Mm -hmm a little bit more, or I should say a little bit less in the jumping off the cliff into the 100 feet deep water method. Which I is jumped what, into the abyss. Which is what uh, we <laughs> used to have to do, what most people use, because you can't, especially with cat, there's no part-time cat. Well, I'll just do it, you know, I'll just, you know, two weekends a, a month yeah. and two weeks a year kind of deal. It's, it's, you're all in or you're all out, right? Because they call you at any time and you've got 24 to 48 hours to get on site. You can't just, you, in other words, you have to like, if you're going to try to do that, you have to have, if you're going to be working, you have to have work that you can, it's easy to get and easy Correct. to quit. Um, and that's not going to penalize you for starting and stopping and starting and stopping. So these days, Uber, Lyft, Postmates, yeah. you know, like no gig a lot of guys delivery stuff. That. No, a lot of guys doing that. It's super easy. It doesn't pay super great. Not but like it used to. Yeah, but it's still very easy to do. It fills in for you. Manage your money. Yeah. Um, which is what we're talking about, managing your exactly. money. Exactly. So so if you have a, a regular career, a regular job, and you you know, you've you're you have benefits and you're working nine to five you know, Monday through Friday. You know, facing a lawsuit can be a terrifying and stressful experience, jeopardizing your years of hard work and success. If you don't have adequate insurance coverage as an adjuster, you're putting yourself at great financial risk. If you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you must get errors and emissions and general liability insurance coverage. It doesn't matter if you're a 1099 or a W-2 or you work carrier direct, Protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the insurance for adjusters free guide, head on over to cplic.net slash adjuster TV. That's cplic.net slash adjuster TV. You can, you, these days, you can transition gradually by doing inspect things, something like on inspectors on demand and you know photo inspections and this photo scopes and things like that um, for property and auto um, on the nights and weekends yep. right so and then in the meantime while you're building up your chops and you're developing your relationships with these companies which is important um, you are also saving money so you're right. you're knocking off going out to eat you know, date nights at home or date nights, so it's free, something free. It's, you've got to save back every penny because. Two for once. Yeah. So when, <laughs> you know, Taco Tuesday. Yeah. So when you, when you do decide to jump or the big opportunity comes along, hurricane, whatever, you know, or something comes up and they say, hey, listen, you know, we, can you go do this thing for us? You're going to be gone for two weeks and you have to quit your job. If you have your regular job and you got benefits and everything, you may have to quit cold turkey. There may not be a two week, yeah, you know, window. Which you're gonna that bridge is burnt to the ground at yeah. that place. You're not gonna be able to go back, right? You want to have enough of a cushion there to where you can get out. And then if you only go and work two to four or six weeks, and then you, it's dead for several months, 
you got to have other work lined up so that you can not be digging into your savings, right? Which is a key, a very, very important thing for people to do in general on, with this kind of work. Because you make a bunch of money during cat season, and then you spend the rest of the year spending that money, which is what a lot of people, was I, was what I've, I've done in yeah. the past, right? So I'm going to throw a little monkey wrench in this as do well. It. So. One of the things that I saw happen to somebody, it happened to me, but I'm not in the same position they were in, that uh, they were ready to make the jump into adjusting full-time and, and everything. I think this year was probably a really good year for people to do it if they knew how to do it right and manage everything. Well, they had a full-time job, sick of it, hated it, looking for the first opportunity to jump out of it, accepted a deployment Walked in their boss's office. They, they got the phone call on Thursday. Supposed to start on Sunday. Uh, walked in their boss's office on Friday morning. Quit. And then they find out on Saturday the deployment was canceled. Yeah, and that happens. And so now they're without income and without a job. Yeah, and, uh, they're watching that bridge just burn and just flames. Yeah, and you know, and now they're sitting there going, "What do we do?" Luckily, the person had some; they weren't living totally paycheck to paycheck. And luckily, within about three weeks, they got another opportunity. Yeah. Okay, but the panic that this person had, the, the phone call I received yeah. from this person was just of absolute. Just what have I done? <laughs> right. What have, and that is a reality, and it is something that can happen. And I will tell you that it happened. I saw so many deployments where a company was told, yeah, you need to have these people start on this day. And they gathered all the people today, together, and then all of a sudden, boom, it didn't happen. I was a victim of it twice, you know, turned down other deployments, only to find out later on that I didn't have any work. But luckily, you know, I found work pretty quick afterwards. But that's that's so remember so when you talk about wanting to jump in and become a cat adjuster, okay, there is and when you're talking about being independent, there is nothing guaranteed. Absolutely zero. There is no safety net. There is no security. Mm -hmm. There is nothing nobody owes you anything except to pay you for the work you did. That's right. Okay. And if you haven't done any work, it don't matter. And so just remember, when you decide to burn that bridge with that employer, you've burnt that bridge. And there's, you know, yeah. just, just be careful that, yep. and that when you take a deployment, because it could, it could blow up on you. Or you're the guy that took, knew somebody that took a deployment, was jumped out and went on a deployment, was thought it was going to last a while and it lasted two weeks and they didn't get another one for three months. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and they had to figure out how to make two weeks worth of really good money last for three months. And I'll be honest with you for what he was making. I think he probably earned the same amount of money in those two weeks. It probably would have made on the three months at his job. So I think he did. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And listen, it's, it's, uh, I've got a video out about how to change careers after the age of 50. Yep. And in it, I talk about, planning that change, that transition. And I, th I think that people have to be realistic about this, right? It's not, you don't jump in from one, out, out of one and right into the, into the other one. It's just, it happens, but it's an exception that proves the rule, right? So in other words, the way most people do it is that it takes some time to get into it. It's fits and starts. It may take a couple of years before you finally get into it. If you have a plan and you're willing to do things a little bit more unorthodox than you know maybe what the conventional wisdom would say then i think you'll be because this is such an unorthodox job to begin with if you're willing to think outside of the box a little bit have some more have some patience and an expectation it's going to take longer then then you're delighted and surprised when it doesn't take longer if it does if it happens to not take longer if you get a, a surprise deployment but i would say your most valuable thing that you have is your job in hand, right? The, the, the work that you have now is your most valuable asset, right? So if you want to transition and become, go get into this, you're basically running your own business as an independent adjuster, whether it's auto or property. If you want to do this kind of work and 
transition into it's a little bit more, it's a lot more dynamic as far as you know your income and everything else, but it's also more dynamic in the opportunities. There's the the ceiling on it is a lot higher, right? right than it is if you go corporate where you're constrained to you're in the lane and you're going to be locked in there with claims. You can almost, almost write your own ticket. The more efficient you are, the more money you can make, the more claims you can handle, the better relationships you have, et cetera. You can build a, a career where you're making low to mid ish six figures, right? If you do it right, because you're your own business, but you, you've got to, it's, you don't just show up. It's not a nine to five. You can't bring a nine to five mentality to it. Also, you have to cultivate this, the kind of attitude that's going to make you very successful as an independent adjuster before you become an independent adjuster. In other words, I'm going to have, you know, if I'm working a job, I've been there for six years, it's a good job. It's okay. You know, I don't mind it. I like the people I work with and everything, but I, 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 I'm looking at the numbers. I'm running out the numbers for the next 20 years. And I don't see them working necessarily in my favor or necessarily the way I want them to work, the, the kind of lifestyle maybe I want to get into, right? So I'm looking for other opportunities. I'm looking for other jobs, other careers, other potential ways to earn a living. Oh, look, we got insurance claims. You know, maybe you meet somebody, you know, neighbor's friend or the neighbor, you know, hurricane shows up and he's packing his pickup truck up and he's got a ladder on top of it and he's pulling out of the driveway. And like, hey, where are you going, man? Oh, I'm going down to the hurricane. Four months later, he comes back with a brand spanking new pickup truck and a new ladder and everything else and a bunch of, you know, he's making it rain all over the place. What did you do? Tell me about that job. I want to do that. It sounds awesome, right? If you decide that you want to get into it and do it, then, and you've got this good job that you're already making a good income on and you're able to save some money, you're making more than your expenses, right? I'm going to say, be prepared to save back as much money as possible. I mean, if we want to talk about a minimum, I'm going to say a minimum amount of time, not a minimum amount of money. The minimum amount of money that you can save back that will cover you for like a year, a long time, not like three months, not two months, not six months even, but I would be looking at years, like how much money can I save that's going to cover, feed my family, cover all my, you know, all my debts and all my everything I got to pay for at least 12 months, at least, right? And I'm going to stay at that job until I have that amount of money saved up. My wife, you know, she's got a job too. We're both saved together, right? If she's not working, then maybe there's something that she can do part-time or, or, or if, if it's vice versa, whatever it is. We're bringing in all the money. At all, it's all getting piled into this savings account that's going to go to cover our butts while we are transitioning into becoming property yeah, That adjusted. touches another point about your spouse. Yeah. If you're if you're having to sell your spouse on you doing this job and this career, probably going to put a big old damper in your relationship because yeah, yeah. it she ha, or he your spouse has to be on board 100 percent with this because oh, yeah. it it takes a lifestyle change on both parts it takes a sacrifice on both parts you know. Here's basically what happened with, with me, and this is this is how I knew it was it was something I had been looking at for a long time. It wasn't something I just woke up one day and said, "Well, I think I'm going to become an adjuster." You know, um, my initial exposure through it was was through a friend of mine I went to high school with, and and I was looking at doing it, and and then some health issues came up that kept me from it a little while, and then finally I was in that position where I thought this is what I want to do, and so I was. I had gone back into the car business for a little while and was just absolutely hating it. It was sucking the life out of me. And I um, was talking to my wife one day and said, you know, this is what I've been thinking about doing. And she goes, well, what's it going to take for you to get your license and get started? And I said, well, there's this website I can do my training and get my license and it's going to, or not my license, but to get my test done. It's going to cost me about 300 bucks and you know my licensing is going to cost about another 70 bucks plus some fingerprints 40 bucks you know and and she looks at me and she goes do you need my credit card you know and and then i just said no i got my own we're good and uh 
You ever feel like you've been thrown to the wolves by the IA firms you work for, like you're just a number on a roster? Wouldn't it be nice to work with a firm who's big enough to get plenty of work, but still small enough to know you by your first name? Then let me tell you about my friends at the Oklahoma-based IA firm, Paysetter Claim Service. Founded in 1997, the thing that sets Paysetter apart is their relentless pursuit of excellence. They hold themselves and their team of adjusters to a higher standard of quality. And now with their advanced all-in-one claims platform called Evo, you'll get a real-time Uber-style map and communication link to the insured, automatic messages sent to customers throughout the process, file review automation, and a fast, accurate scope with Paysetter's partnership with Hover. Hover is integrated directly into Evo, making for a smooth and seamless field scoping experience for you as the adjuster. Technology is moving faster than ever, and Paysetter is right there at the cutting edge. And Paysetter is bringing training to a city near you. Check out their summer tour dates at adjustertv.com slash Paysetter. So we, and, and so, she was 100% on board and supported me 100% through it. And I will tell you that, you know, when we went through those first few months and then if she wasn't whenever the, cause I, I mean, I, I jumped into the abyss. I just, you know, right. I'm, I'm doing this. Um, we were in a good position, you know, so it's not like, you know, it, once my income was gone and we were gonna get foreclosed on or, you know, lose everything. But it was just the fact that she stood behind me. You know, she said, this is what we want yeah. to do, and this is what I want you to do. And, it, and and she stood behind me on it. If it hadn't been for that, and it got tight, and she knew that she had to change her spending habits because things were going to get tight for a while, and she was willing to sacrifice and do that for me, okay, um, then if, she does, if your spouse doesn't have that same attitude, then it's going to be extremely, extremely difficult to save that far. Uh, to get to that goal and everything else. So uh, make sure that your spouse is 100% on board. Yeah. Because if, if you're the only one saving and she doesn't want to change the lifestyle and change her spending habits or his spending habits, and it's just not going to work, man. And you're going to be fighting all the time. And then when you do hit the road and you're, you're, you're making money, but you're gone, and she's now having to take up the slack for the things that you, or he has to take up the slack for the things that the other person used to do at home, you know, and that causes stress on them because you're not there and then all that money is going in the bank account and they're seeing all the money in the bank account and they start spending the money because i've known other this didn't happen to me this happened to other people i knew they're putting large amounts of money in the bank and their spouse is seeing it and then the spouse is spending the money or thinking that that's all this extra money and then all of a sudden they come back in town and there's no income for a month and then the money's gone because they had money and they spent it apparently there's a lack of communication lack of communication lack they of didn't it. understand that they didn't understand that hey yeah i'm working but that doesn't mean this work is going to continue and so you have to budget and you have to keep a budget yeah um just because you go from making you know whatever you were making before to 15 20 grand a month you know on your first cat well that doesn't mean that's going to, you're going to make that every month for the next 12 months for the right. next seven years. It's, it's no. just, it doesn't work that way, no. you know? Um, but that's, you got to change that. You got to, yeah. you got to just keep your budget, keep living, living frugal, you know? And, uh, and I would say even once you first get started and I mean, I had a fantastic year. I mean, I can't, my first full year out, you know, man, I, I couldn't have imagined accomplishing what I accomplished. But then, you know, hey, I, now you're sitting there in a situation where you're looking at it going, well, all the storm seasons are over. Welcome and, to the uh, off season, James. Yeah, the off season's here. And so I'm probably not going to see anything until March. You know, I might get lucky and get a desk assignment or, you know, work some dailies. And, and I'm working dailies. But, to, you know, he, now the money's in the bank, you know, and yeah. I got to make that money stretch, you know, to the, to the next season. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I go even farther and say that money's sitting in the bank. You need to protect it yeah. and not touch it. So in other words, so, you know, what I was getting at was ultimately was however long it takes to save back as much money as possible. The minimum amount, again, I'll say I'll just go out, just throw the, the, a year out there and yeah. just say if it takes five years to do that, then that's what you need to do. I agree 100 percent. You probably need a minimum of a year, yeah. you know, save back or know that you can survive 
you yeah. know, for a year with one person. If you're if it's a two household, a two income household, you can survive with one person's income for a year, or right, right, you exactly. have resources that can sustain you. Worst thing you do though is to go in debt to do get into do this that. career. Don't do it. Okay. So yeah. So then don't mortgage your house. Always be finding. Always <laughs> be having in your mind that you've got to protect. You've got to be able to pay your bills period, right? So whatever that takes, if one spouse stays working and you, the other spouse, um, goes and drives for Uber, right? Yep. While they're also picking, starting to transition and do auto you know, appraisals and, you know, photo is scope and all that virtual assist stuff, right? And they're ramping up that way, then do that, right? If you can still, if, as long as you can cover your bills and then that way, you know, maybe it took you two and a half years to save up a year's worth of money to have just as a like a big fat emergency fund that you just hold back and you never you don't even look at it, right? And then you still keep working. You don't just stop working when you get that money and then live off that money while you're trying to become an adjuster. I wouldn't absolutely not do that. Quit your day job, put your two weeks notice in, be cool, don't burn that bridge because you may have to come back. Right. You may have to come back, right? Then protect all the money that you save, those big chunks of money. When you go work on cat. When you do finally get a cat, which is going to be, and we, at the very beginning of this, you said, you know, one of the first things you need to do is get a license and then apply at firms. I agree with that, right? Even before you get training, even before you get an Xactimate certification, go ahead and get on the rosters. Yep. Why? Well, first of all, when you apply at these companies, they're not going to, they're going to look at your resume, but they're not going to like it's not going to be, it's not like applying at other places. You can get on a roster with right. literally nothing, even without a license. You can get on, you can't get deployed, right? Even though you're on the license or on the roster until you get a license or you get some licenses and you start, or you start get picking up other training, right? Which you've got to do on your own, right? It's incumbent upon the, the person, the adjuster to take care of all their own training no matter what, because the better you do at the job, the better you're going to do at the career, right? So don't sit there and say, well, I want to go work for this company because they have free training, or I want to go do this. You know, which one of these, these adjuster schools should I go to? Go to all of them. I mean, yeah. come on, this is your income and your ability to do this job and to crush it as an adjuster depends on you being really good at the job, not what you can put on a resume saying, checking off some checkbox, right? level two Xactimate certification. You don't, long story short, you don't get the level two Xactimate certification so you can put it on your resume to impress somebody who's not even gonna look at it. They're just gonna put you on the roster. Right. You get that so that you can be good at Xactimate and you can be a good adjuster. Exactly. That's why you do That's that. That's why you do it. You don't, it's not, you're not, you do all these things for yourself first so that you can be good at the job. If you're good at the job, then you're gonna be, you're gonna work. They're gonna put you to work because they need good people, right. right? I just totally lost my train of thought. You're okay, man. We love you, man. <laughs> okay. You know, to what you were saying, when you you get on a roster, you know, all you are, okay, and we've touched on this in a previous discussion, you're a resource for them, okay? Yeah, yeah. You're a resource that they have to go to, okay? When you're new, okay, you were so far down the roster, okay? They, oh, you're at the bottom of it. You know, managers have, we talk about the first call list. Yeah. Okay. Um, managers have people they like. So whenever they get assigned to a, to a storm, they've got a list of people who immediately they're going to send to recruiting and say, get these people in here. Okay. Or whoever you know, makes the phone calls. Dispatch. Um, get these people in here. These are the people I want if they're available. Um, so you're not going to get that first phone call right no. off the bat. And then you have other people that, you know, they've performed in the past and they've, you know, they're probably good at it and they've got a decent rating with the company. You know, then those people are going to get called and then you're going to get called last. Yep. Right? But what's going to help you though, get move up the ladder is a lot of these companies, um, like Alacrity, um, Pilot, Everill, all these companies, um, have their own training. Okay. They've, they've, put money into training videos and things like that. And some of them have prerequisites that you have to do before they're going to send you out working for their clients. One of the things you have to do is the California, you know, 
compliant thing that you have to do every year. You got to do that with every company you're on the roster with. I found that out. It doesn't transfer from one company to another. You can't say, well, I did it with another company. Here's my certificate. You still got to do it with another company. Right. So, um, but get in there and get into their training. Okay. And, and start taking some of the training that they're offering online for free. Whenever they're sitting there looking at people, you know, so they're now starting to start digging a little bit to people that maybe haven't worked with them before, but it's on the roster. If they've got somebody who's gone through and done about 20 of their, of their, you know, modules, oh, yeah. you know, and they've got a guy that hasn't done any, hey, at least they know that you're serious about this, this career and you're serious about working and you want to be compliant with what they want and you've taken the time to get some training the way that they want you to be trained yep. in their system, you're going to get noticed that way. Yep. So that's a, I mean, that's, that's just a no-brainer, and I've got at least four companies that I have probably spent, you know, over the course of the past year, literally a hundred hours, you know, doing training with, you know, just going. Well, I've got time; I'm not doing anything. I can sit down and watch Netflix and drink beer, or you know, I can go fishing for a little while. Nope, weather sucks; the wind's too high. I got nothing to do. I could go, you know. Well, you know what? I, or I could sit down and I could further my career and increase my chances yeah. of getting making money. And I can log into one of these companies and see what modules they have available that might interest me that I haven't done yet, you know, yeah. and that will increase your opportunities for deployments to get on hill deployments and everything else. And I maybe not have to wait for a hurricane. These days, there are a growing number of remote work opportunities for independent adjusters with scoper writer programs popping up all over the place. You can do photo and scope in the field, or you can just sit at home in your pajajays and write the estimates on what the scoper got when they were out in the field. And it doesn't matter where you live, as long as you have the internet, you can write claims as a desk adjuster. But you can't get that sweet gig without being licensed. So if you live in Nebraska, which doesn't require an adjuster to be licensed, you still have to have a New York license to write claims somebody scoped in New York. Makes sense? Of all the credentials you need as an adjuster, there really is none more important than your adjuster license, especially your first one. You're going to need it to do just about everything else, including some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. So you need Adjuster Pro. Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain your adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as an adjuster with resources for every licensing state, including dead simple CE packages. Adjuster Pro is the gold standard for adjuster licensing. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjuster pro right now. So yeah, exactly, exactly right. and and. It's important to note that the first call list is not something that you can get on if you've never worked claims. Right. Pretty much, unless you are already like a really great adjuster and you have a track record and you're experienced, if you're brand new, there's no way. Like literally just about zero yeah. chance. And the reason why isn't because, you know, you're, something on your resume or whatever, it's because the first call list is actually generated by the carrier. It's right. adjusters that they have already seen the work of these people and they say, we like these guys and gals because they do a great job every time they show up on site. We like these two new people that you brought in because they have potential. So we want, when we send, when they have a cat mm -hmm. and the insurance company calls the IA firm and says, hey, we need 15 adjusters. It would be really great also if eight of them were these, these people on this list, you've already worked for us, they're already certified to run claims for us, et cetera, right? That's, that's the true first call list. Right. So you can't get on the first call list until you've actually run claims for a company. Um, and again, if you're already an experienced adjuster, then you're probably gonna be known anyway, and if you've got nine years of experience doing all different kinds of claims, absolutely they're gonna send you. It's not right. that you're not gonna get on the first call list that way, but the IA firm knows that you're experienced. They're going to put you on this. And then, so when we talk about training, when, when these big companies, um, Alacrity, Eberl, Pilot, Renfro, all these companies, yep. when they offer free training, there's two different kinds, right? There's the learning management system stuff, the LMS stuff that's on their websites that Jane, you're talking about, yep. right? So like you go on pilotcat.com, there are probably thousands of hours of 
free tra- anything probably anything you ever want to know about anything to do with claims on their website and they spend a lot of money on that and they have trouble getting people to get in there and take advantage of that it's right there it's free you just gotta like you get on the roster you just log in and just start watching videos watching looking at this training right the other kind of training that they have is when they when they say hey come up for three or four days or five days or two days or whatever it is we'll teach you some exact to me we'll teach you scoping we'll teach you this that and the other thing it's going to be to get a carrier certification right mm-hmm. so they're not going to teach you generic it's not free generic adjuster training it's at the end of it you're state farm certified or you're ready to take the test to be state farm certified right so they're going to teach you to a carrier certification right it's not just they don't just offer just generic adjuster training to anybody for free um right and you want to get those right for a number of reasons right number one you can't probably can't work for you probably you, your chances are increased when you work for the big ia firms who have accounts with the big insurance companies because they're going to have just more opportunities period because there's just more claims more mm-hmm. policyholders, right so you want to get the state farm certification you want to get your all state rating you want to get you know whatever you can get your hands on that's first and foremost secondly those are going to be um live in-person trainings for the most part or they should be right hopefully by now they they are they are hopefully the vaccine was a thing <laughs> so those are also outstanding networking opportunities right because the trainers they're they're looking at the people in class they're evaluating people in the class and they're not just evaluating them based on their scores or how well they're doing on the tests or the whatever they're watching them they're seeing how many questions that person asks in class this is what trainers tell me right we want to see somebody who's got some spark in there they like get excited about it they're the first person sitting down and they're always got their hand up and they're or they're trying to answer questions because they read the material the night before right they're into it they're they, they're all in they're ready to go they're super excited they they're identifying as adjusters i'm an adjuster right even though they've never handled a claim before they have changed their identity or they're starting to, to make their identity be instead of i'm a you know body shop you know technician right. i'm a you know, I'm a receptionist or I'm a dental hygienist or I'm whatever. I'm an adjuster, right? They're ready to go, right? That person's going to get attention. That person's going to end up on a much shorter list of newbies who have potential that companies like State Farm, not every carrier does this. They, some of the bigger insurance companies have a requirement that IA firms, when they send people, they have to send at least one or two new people. I think it's part of their contract. Like State Farm, I think, says something like two new people, depending on the size of the cat. Um, this may have changed, of course, since I was told this, right. but they're required to because they want to always keep fresh people coming in because people retire out, right? Because the average age of an insurance adjuster is 50 something. It's our age, right? right? It's in the 50s. So they want to have new people coming in. They want to be able to develop new talent and always have, you know, it's, it's right. security for everybody, right? So you may end up on the shorter list of newbies that might get that those opportunities before the guy who's just mailing it in or shows up late. Or, and on top of that, the IA firms, their pecking order is affected by the quality of the people they bring to the game. Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah, because so, more than one IA firm will run claims for one carrier. Right. So what will end up happening is if they're just sending in just like, you know, Bob the body shop guy who's now decided he wants to be Bob the builder and do construction Bob the adjuster claims. Guy. Yeah, Bob the adjuster guy. And, and uh, but yet he totally failed at it because whenever he was in the class and certification classes and everything else, he was just on his phone and not paying attention yeah had the you know walked in late to from every break you know everything else they bring that guy who's not showing any interest you know and then he totally fails out because he didn't really pay attention in class well that affects that ia firm and their rating yeah and 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 it's a big big deal to them so they want to make sure that they've somewhat vetted you before they send you out But again, when you get in a major cat situation, it's like a hurricane, hey, you just need a pulse. Listen, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I love the guy, the guy with the stories. 
He's he's a good guy. He's got this is a, a guy with great customer service, but sometimes he's also the guy that interrupts the, the instructor or interrupts the store manager while they're giving a presentation. Oh yeah, well yeah, I remember that. He just starts talking, just like right in the middle of a meeting or in yep. the middle of class, telling a story about how you know when he he knows about a thing when he did a thing and or disagrees or asks that guy. We love you, but just listen more than you talk. Shut up. <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> depending on this is, these are two different kinds of customer service we're de- demonstrating to you guys. So uh, they just want to see that you're committed to it. And that's how you're going to get your early chances. I mean, again, like you said, go to everything that you can go to. Yeah, absolutely. I've been to state farm training, uh, certification training seven times already just because I wanted to meet new people. <laughs> well, maybe maybe that might be not the truth. You might be exaggerating a little bit. Maybe a little bit. So, yeah, I mean, and it, it may be like um, there are certain carriers where even if you're new, some IA firms will do like a USAA certification, and you may not be able to run claims as a newbie for USAA right. or for Liberty Mutual or something. But you'll, you, they'll still offer that to you, and you still go. And, and it's a two-day thing, right? Those are networking opportunities. Right. You're not necessarily ever going to work USAA, right? Until you've got some experience. Right. But NFIP things, same deal. I did some, some of those in the beginning. All, all of them is an opportunity to go to Colonial in Lexington and sit through a couple of days, and then and then chit chat with those guys afterwards, or over you know over the break, walk up and start talking to the person who's giving the presentation, and just interact, you know, network. I will tell you the. One of the, it's the only reason that I had such a great start to my career was because of going to events, meeting people, you know, remembering people and and networking and creating those relationships. You know, the more things you do, the I mean, just stay busy. Just, you know, yeah. find, if it's important to you, you'll find time to do it. So, well, I don't have time to go to a conference. Well, I don't have time to, I don't have time to go to some meet and greet you know, or something right. like that. If it's important to you, you'll find time to do it. And if you're not finding time to do it, then just go ahead and go find something else to do. It's important. You and know? the thing, the, the, but then the reality is, is that, you know, if it's, if, if it's not important to, for a person to do that kind of thing, to, to get started in a career like this, it's every career can benefit from that kind of, you know, you, you can advance a career by doing these, all the stuff that we're talking about. So, um, I love this business, man. Freaking love it. Uh, you know, I do too. It's like, I guess I wouldn't have started a YouTube channel if I didn't care about it. It's like crack. I just so, can't, can't shake it. Yeah. So, I mean, and as far as like, you know, once you do get work and once you, once you are, you've, you've started to build relationships with companies and you are going out on cat during cat season and then storm season's over, you know, at the end of October, you know, maybe in the, first couple of weeks in November, you're finding yourself at home, go through the holidays. This is kind of the way my years kind of, kind of went to the holidays. And then you get into January and maybe go on a couple of week vacation. You know, that's usually when, if I'm going to go on vacation, I'm going to go then. And then you're sitting on your rear end. You spent, you spent some money traveling around to visit family and stuff. And then you spent some more money traveling to, you know, go sit on the beach. And then you're sitting on your rear end until March, you know, depending on how late the storm season gets started, it might get not get started until May, right? Um, I think this year it was almost April. Yeah, so things really kicked in. You have to, the money that you made the summer before isn't like you can run your 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 personal finance however you want to, but let me give you some advice, everybody. Are you new to the industry and wondering how you can get started as an independent adjuster with little or no experience? I mean, how can you get any experience if you can't get any experience, right? It's a problem as old as time in any profession. While you may have heard of the IA firm and insurance recruiting specialists at the best IRS, the IRS stood for Insurance Recruiting Specialist. However, the best recently did a complete rebrand that better reflects their company goals, changing their name to the Best Claims Solutions. Because there has been a considerable increase in task-driven solutions requested by the Best Claims' clients, adjusters can now get their foot in the door and gain experience with the Best Claims Solutions 
the Best Inspect program. Not only that, but the Best Claims also offers continuous training to you, the adjuster, and their compliance department helps keep you current on your licenses so you'll never find yourself hitting the pause button on a deployment while you re-up your licenses. When you sign up for the Best Claims as roster, you'll be in contact with a dedicated recruiter who will learn more about your skills, experience, and areas of expertise. And once you're onboarded, anytime that there's an opening that fits your skill set, you'll get a call right away. At the Best Claims, their services are 100% completely free for candidates. Once you're on the roster, you'll have access to independent adjusting opportunities around the country so that you can select what's right for you. Get access to the totally free top five tips for preparing for a hurricane deployment video guide over to justyourtv.com slash the best claim. Watch the top five tips for preparing for a hurricane deployment for free right now by going to adjustertv.com slash the best claims. Protect the money that you made on cat. There's a way to manage your finances to where your percentage of money goes off for taxes, percentage of money goes off for, for personal living expenses, rent, you know, mortgage, food, utilities, all that stuff, right? Percentage goes off to storm expenses, percentage goes off to savings, right? There's a there's a way to manage your money in that way so that that money gets all squared away. So when tax time rolls around, you don't get the IRS hitting you, hitting you in the forehead with a hammer. When you get off cat, I strongly encourage you to take a couple of weeks. It takes usually if you have a long storm season, it takes me, it took me two weeks to come down off of it, to stop like with the constant, you know, the, to just, to just relax. And then you may need to, you know, stay up late, you know, go out with friends, sleep in whatever you gotta do guilt free you know don't feel like you have to go home and like you know suddenly jump into being like the world's best whatever just right. take a break that's my point take take a break and then ease back into your life right you my got wife, responsibilities but if you can tell I'm not the kind of guy that sits easy I've always gotta be doing yeah. something and and I, I come home normally whenever I come home from a from a being out of town on a deployment. My first two days, I'm sleeping, man. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, you have to. I mean, I just my first day, it's like I don't think I get out of bed until. I mean, for me, I wake up. I'm an old guy. I wake up. I'm out of bed by five o'clock every morning. Yeah. But that first day after I come home, I think I wake up at about eight o'clock. I'll lay around in bed till nine thirty. <laughs> I might take a shower about noon, right. you know, just that's, and then I think I'm taking a nap about two thirty, you know, and then yeah. going to dinner with my wife that, that night. And then the next day is, I think I might actually have the shower done by 10, you know, ish or so. And then only about the fourth or fifth day, I'm like calling people, you're getting work because I, because I want to work you right, know, always. Right. But like this time, whenever I got back, man, I, when I finished, when I finished, um, Laura, I didn't call anybody. I, I've yet to call anybody for work since then. I've just, I've, I've just enjoyed it. I received one phone call. I went on a 10 day assignment in Virginia, uh, came back from that. And since then I've done a few dailies, you know, and, and haven't done anything because you know what? I'm tired. You know, yeah. I mean, I had a, it, it, it takes a lot of, when you're working, you don't really think about it. And then you finally get the tam, time off and you go, I'm good. I want to, you know, I just take this time off and just enjoy this time off. And, you know, I don't need to be in such a hurry to go anywhere. And, and that's where I'm at right now. But those for, for me, those first few days and first couple of weeks, I'm still thinking about, I'm going to go to work. I want to go to work. I want to go. Oh, to yeah, work. yeah. You yeah. Know, it's, you're buzzing. I mean, you're you just know. like, it's still. Like I said, it's an addiction. You got to shake it off and, and give yourself a chance to like decompress. You know, especially it, after a really, really super long storm season that's eight, nine, 12 months. Yeah. Uh, just go crawl in bed and stay there for a few so days. I left in April. I left in April and finished in November. Yeah, that's a, that's a good run. That's a nice. So that's a that's a typical storm season. It was a. I was never home for more than. I was never home for more than. I think the longest time I was home was like ten days, but other than that, it was five to seven days. I yeah. might be home and I was gone again. It was fantastic. Um, the other thing is is that um, we were talking about taxes and that sort of thing, CPA, CPA, CPA. If you don't have experience of, 
of uh, running a business and knowing all your deductions and things like that, yep. get a good CPA, reach out to them, tell them what you're going to do, go in and sit down. Yes, it's going to cost you some money, but guess what? Those fees are also tax deductible. Uh, yeah. And, and sit down and tell them what you're doing and get that advice from them. I, at one time, I had a CPA that his, his advice was expense it or pay tax on it. When in doubt, just to expense, just go ahead and deduct it. We'll explain it later. Well, <laughs> I don't have that guy anymore. Uh, that guy was back in the early aughts. And, right. uh, and now the guy I have now is extremely conservative. You know, yeah. he, he, he'll sit there and he'll slap my hand on occasion. But it, the rules have changed over the last couple of years. They changed as far as uh, ex employee expenses, what employees can deduct and can't deduct. And I think that goes back, to, this goes to another topic we may be talking about soon, W-2 versus 1099. That's no, what you're talking about right now. Um, 1099-1099, when you're working 1099, pretty much everything you do is tax deductible. Your gas, your, your, or your mileage, your hotel, your food, everything, your, all your equipment, everything is, absolutely everything is tax deductible. When you work as a W-2 employee, those rules change. And the rules change, and I'm not going to even attempt to give advice on that, but a lot of your unreimbursed employee expenses are no longer tax deductible. And uh, and so you need to pay attention and, and, and get with a CPA about that. Um, and again, I'm not giving advice here, and I'm not pretending that I'm giving advice or anything like that, but one of the things that uh, is a gray area, or and it might be black and white, and this is why you need to talk to a uh, tax professional, is you know if you're getting hired as an employee by a company and let's say you live in one state and you go to another state and your assignment is in that state okay um your living expense is not tax deductible this is what i was told i don't know if this is true or not but i was told that 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 uh, hotel room you're paying all those weeks for, you're not getting to deduct that. Um, this is why you need to talk to a tax professional and find out what you need to do in that scenario. Right. Well, that you also be. have to pay it tax in every state that you work And you in. also have to pay tax in it. So like this year, I'll be paying taxes in several states, and uh, which yeah. I've never had to do that in my life. And I'm they like, charge you for every return they do. That's right. And so that's the other thing about being 1099 is, Where's your business domiciled at? That's where you're paying your tax at, okay? Um, versus W-2, you're paying income tax in every single state. Right. Okay, because even though I may have worked in another state temporarily, okay, um, I wasn't there enough to be deemed a, a residence and I was being paid a fee. My company that's based in Texas was being paid the fee. Right. Even though I ran up there to do the work. So there's some gray areas in there, and you got to make sure you get solid, solid advice on that that's stuff. That's right. That's right. You know, but uh, um, I had nine states on one one year. I'm not going to have that many. I, I had think nine I've, returns, nine state returns, and then federal. And the, the thing about the state returns is, and people are like, why do I have to pay tax? And you get credit for tax paid. So you're not going to get double, triple, right. nine times taxed on the same. So if you thing. paid like five grand into Louisiana, well, that's five grand, not a tax credit, but it's a deduction. Get a CPA. Get a CPA. For exactly. sure. And not just, I mean, H&R Block is great and everything, but I would say. Get a CPA. Get a, get a yeah, somebody who does Good tax, tax professional. Keep if not a CPA, a tax professional that you can trust. Yeah. And that's the best way to go. Again, anything I said here today is not advice. I don't know what I'm talking about. I let my CPA tell me We're what to do. We're clueless, frankly. And honestly. I just let him tell me, here's basically what happens is, here's my stuff. And then he'll call me and ask me some questions. And then it's, here, sign this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and send me a check. You know, that's it. And send me a check. That's, that's the way yep. it works. Um, Speaking of which, I had this one huh? where I got audited by the IRS. Did you really? Twice. Oh. But <clears throat> it was one of those things. I mean, if you get audited, and I think it's, it's fairly common for adjusters to get audited, um, we had been kind of moving around a little bit. We were full-time in the RV, and the, the IRS had sent some letters. Whoa. Right? And so when I finally got a hold of somebody, after I, like, stopped freaking out and losing my mind and not... not and, 
you know, losing sleep for a week. When I finally got a hold of somebody, they told me, and they're pretty cool about it, surprisingly. They said, listen, if we send you a letter, like it's, it's in, when it first gets flagged for an audit, it's for, for whatever reason, it's in this department, in this whatever area, zone, division, right? We're going to send a few letters. They're going to send a few letters out of that division. And if you don't respond, then you're going to escalate it to the next one, the next department. And I don't have any idea what the names of these departments are or whatever. Right. It's just the next department. They're going to add some fees and interest charges, and, and they're going to, the letter will get a little bit nastier. They'll send some letters. If you don't respond to those letters, then they send it to the next one, right? Once it's escalated to these different things, and that's where you're at, right? You can't mm-hmm. go back. They said... The reason I was audited, and the reason why I got escalated up to, like, to the third or fourth or whatever it was department is because I never got the letters. They sent it to some old address that right. I wasn't at anymore. I hadn't lived there for years. I have no idea why. Because, I mean, my, they have my most recent tax right. return or whatever. Anyway, they wanted to see proof of my mileage, right? Because I had like 36,000 miles that I was, you know, deducting for, for work, which was, you know. Right. They had to see proof of it, Right. I basically, I didn't like have like a log that I did necessarily. I just knew I had this many miles and I kind of kept track of the beginning and then the end and whatever. And when I was on cat anyway, so I said, so what do you need? What does the log need to look like? Like what is, what's the format for it? It's like, however you do it. They're like, if you, you know, if you put it on a cocktail napkin, then show us that. Right, I was like, oh, well, okay. So, but I mean, I so I grabbed a cocktail napkin. Yeah, so I so I did it the way, you know, I did it the way I was. I, I put it all on a calendar, showing mm-hmm. when I was working and then at the beginning mileage and the ending mileage, and I send that to them, and that was it. I had to pay like f- some amount of money plus some interest and whatever. So I had, I had to give them some money, um, and I sent the check in, right? Right, and then I let a week or so pass, maybe ten days. I called back. And talked to this this young woman um, who was sounded she was it was the best customer service I've ever right. got on a phone call. It was it was a little bit weird. Anyway, so I was I called and I said, Hey, my name is Matthew Allen, and you know she could confirm some information, yada yada. Just calling to check on the status of my payment for this audit that I just had for 2012. I think it was 2012, or I, I, for the, for the audit. And she goes, Oh, which one? And I said, what do you mean, which one? And she, I heard her pause for a second. I heard a clicky clackety sound. She goes, oh, they just sent the letter for the next one. I was like, the next, the next audit? What? <laughs> She's like, yeah, this is kind of what happens when you get audited is they'll, they'll, they'll audit you up to three times in a row. You can almost always count on getting a second audit. It was for the same exact thing. She's like, we just want to see your mileage again. She's like, send that in and, we'll, and this will go away like right now. I was like, okay. She's like, send it to this address, make it attention to the so-and-so. Sent that in, and it was, you know, over. Freaked me out. I mean, big time. But I was so glad that when I talked to the person, sometimes if you call the IRS number, yep. it's not the right number. You'll oh, sit yeah. there on for 20 minutes listening to ads. Have you done that? Have you got, called that number? No. It's, I don't call the IRS. Yeah. My CPA does I don't, that. I, I try to avoid calling the My IRS whenever possible. That. So but, long story short, and for mileage, you can for your vehicle, you can either deduct vehicle expenses like actual right. vehicle expense, like or tires mileage. and oil changes or gas, or you can deduct mileage. Mileage is better. Mileage is way better, infinity better, because you might be able to, to deduct fifteen thousand dollars or twelve thousand dollars. You're not going to spend that much money on your car. It's fifty-seven cents, I think, right now per mile Something at this like moment. Um, Who knows? What and it is. so, you know, if you wrote, drove, just make it real simple. You know, for every for every 10,000 miles you drive, do the math. I can't do the math. 10,000 times, times 0. 0.57. 0. 0.57. Yeah, 5,700. Yeah, so 30,000 miles, I mean, that's that's fifteen or $20,000. Yeah. yeah. From your adjusted growth, we're not, we're not tax experts, yeah. but you're taxed on the money that you take home after expenses, yep. right? And the percentage of your at your tax bracket is applied to that amount. The broad strokes of it. Always, always, always get a tax person because tax the tax rules have changed several times in yep. the last fifteen years with uh, the affordable health health care thing. You know they changed that around. Then yep. that's one of the that's when the like the whole hourly deal started up. 
because of them not wanting to pay for health insurance for every adjuster. Yeah. So it, they're going to change again this year for sure. I'll have, if I don't drive any more miles which for business this year, which I doubt I will, um, I will have 36,000 miles this year. Yeah. Yeah. I had, believe it or not, a year that I didn't even run claims, I had 50,000 miles in I can believe deductions. That. I was driving for Uber. Yeah. And doing post, like Postmates delivery gig, like, yeah. like app delivery stuff. Anyway. So. I can see that. Yeah. Easily. So. What do you got? I had this one. It's not really that exciting. It's more of a funny story. So. Working hell on auto hell. Um, we're sitting there on the drive, you know, wait for cars to come in. And I see one pop up, 2008 Expedition. I'm like, well, you don't see very many of those these days. We'll see what it comes in. And, uh, 2000 what? 2008 oh. Expedition. <laughs> All of a sudden, we look over, and here it comes through the gate. It's this red Expedition, and it's got these little blue triangles all over it. Guy pulls in, and we notice it's blue painter's tape. Old guy jumps out, he goes, helped y'all out a little bit there and marked all the dents for you. He had gotten some blue painter's tape and was cutting little triangles off of it and putting them on each dent of the vehicle. You know, which, you know, obviously the guy's retired and doesn't have a lot of time. You know, he's got a lot of time on his hands, you know. And I wish we could just pop this photo up here, man. It, but it doesn't do any good for people listening. But it, I just looked at this and go, wow, that's impressive. You know, he even got up on the roof of this thing and marked him on the roof. <laughs> and uh, however, what generally happens is that people, you know, when you look at hell on a vehicle, you get, you know, you get a hell of an eye. Okay, you can see things that most people don't right, see, right, right. and and nobody's ever correct. Everybody that comes in that they think that they've marked their hell, and they go, "Ah, it's not that bad." It's got like ten hits on the hood, and I look at it, so I'm looking at like eighty. You know, and it's really that that big of a difference. And so I'm looking at this, going, "All right, well, he's probably put tape on top of dents, you know, that I can't see." And and technically, you really don't count all the dents. So this is a li another little secret, you know, when you're counting hell dents on a car. Fenders, doors, you're probably going to count all the dents. Roof rails, you're probably going to count the dents, okay? Hoods, roofs, deck lids, you're going to just, like, look at a small section of it, like a corner, and 25% of it, and you're going to count what's there times four and move on right you know right. Uh, that's that's really the way it works and it's you're, you're going to be so accurate you know either you're not and when the techs go to look at it to repair it either you're spot on or you might be a little off a little low a little high but overall you're going to be there and even if you are you know off you know you're you went too low the tech's not going to complain about it. He's just going to he's just going to roll with it and go. Oh, they just want to make sure you get your dent counts correct. Right. Make sure you get your oversize correct. That's all the techs care about and the shops care about. Anyway, we get through this thing and and so I'm, I counted his dents on his hood just to humor it. The guy actually put a hundred and one pieces of tape on the hood. A <laughs> <laughs> hundred and one pieces of tape on the hood. And I looked at the roof. I'm like going, I'm not even going to attempt to count. You know, but uh, it was just this old guy just said it. And so sure enough, I'm looking at that, you know, going, I wonder when I'll ever see that again. Next day, this guy comes up and he's in a Lexus, that's uh, the SUV 350, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. He's got clear tape that he put on top of each dent that he thought was each dent, you know. Right. And, uh, and it was like, you know, you got to get all that stuff off there, right? <laughs> <laughs> the blue planer tape is a whole lot easier to take off. Right, you know, right. but you put clear tape With all over it. Tape. And it's just funny that people do that stuff. You know, and the stuff that you see, you know, and, and again, people have never done this before. They, they don't go through it. They don't know what to expect. They want to make sure they get taken care of correctly. So they want to kind of right. help point you in the right direction. And, uh, and it's, but also the most irritating thing is whenever you're actually out, it's just like with, 
homeowners. Oh, yeah. Uh, I deal with it with homeowners. I deal with it with vehicle owners. They're puppy dogging the heck out of you, man. They're following you around, you know. And I and I have this spiel, okay? The first thing I say to somebody when I get up, they call up and say, here's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to look at your vehicle. I'm going to look at every bit of your vehicle. I'm going to look at every panel. I'm going to touch every piece of metal on this vehicle, okay? I'm going to look at all the plastic, okay? If there's a dent on this vehicle, I'm going to see it, okay? If I do happen to miss it and I'm not correct, what's going to happen is, is that you're the place where you get it fixed, we'll send in a supplement and we'll address it at that time. I said, but I'm pretty good at this. I'm probably not going to miss it. Okay. But I'm not perfect, but there'll be a supplement. Oh, well, I want to make sure you look at the roof because <laughs> right. there's some dents up there and on the, on the quarter panel back there, on the refrigerator, you'll get some. Okay. Not a problem. They get out of the car. And as you're like looking, counting dents in one area, they're going to go, they'll be pointing. They'll be pointing at the at the different like make sure you see this right, right. Oh, did you see the did you see the the molding around the the door? Uh, there's I haven't got that far yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, and you're on the. Of course, I always start on the front left corner, work my way around. I'm going around. I start front front left corner. I'm going around. I'm on the opposite side of the vehicle. Did you see this on this side over here? You know, like I'll be there in a minute. <laughs> I'll be there in a minute. You know, and it's just it's. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, people, if you, if it's people, people. They they just. And when you're walking around somebody's house after a hailstorm, and you're inspecting the house, Same and they're deal. pointing at the gutters, you know, yeah. did you see that up there? Here's another one on the downspout. Yeah. yeah. Oh, um, by the way, there's some uh, there's some dents on my smoker out back. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's go out there and look at it. Well, there's not there's no dents on it. It's just hail splatter. Yeah. It didn't yeah, dent, right. you know, but they want to be compensated for the hail splatter on the. Uh, you know, so yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, man. I'm gonna buy you some. Uh, I'm gonna buy you some car wax, and if you just go over the top of that smoker with it, guess what? It'll buff it right out. You'll yeah, be right. good. Okay, thanks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's all I got. Well, I guess it's time for dad joke time. Dad joke bingo. All right. You know, I had two dogs. I didn't know that. Yeah, they're named Timex and Rolex. Great watchdogs. <laughs> that, that one was all the way down. If you enjoyed this episode of Adjuster TV Radio, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Find more episodes at adjustertv.com slash podcast. This is Adjuster TV.